All right, these are the notes for pre-calc appendix A.3. You will probably be spending about a day and a half on this, but I am going to record it all as one video. The targets for this section, I will be able to identify the domain of an algebraic expression. I will be able to reduce rational expressions and perform operations with rational expressions. And we will be able to simplify compound rational expressions. All right, the first thing, we have a couple definitions. The difference between a fractional expression and a rational expression. A fractional expression, a fraction, is the quotient of two algebraic expressions. So here's an example, all right? Quotient means we're dividing. We have two algebraic expressions, one in the numerator, one in the denominator. That's a fractional expression. If it is a rational expression, it has to be written as the ratio of two polynomials. So this first example is fractional, but it is not a rational equation, a rational expression, because this is not a polynomial. But our second example, both the numerator and the denominator are polynomials. So we have the ratio of two polynomials. This one is a, fra is a rational expression. Unlike polynomials, which are defi defined for all real numbers, all right, so that means we can plug any number in there for x and it will work. Some algebraic expressions are not defined for some numbers. All right, there are some things that do not make it true. So the domain of an algebraic expression is the set of real numbers for which an algebraic expression is defined. So we're going to start out looking at what are the domains for these algebraic expressions. The first one, 3x squared minus x plus 5, is just a regular polynomial. So it is defined for all real numbers. In interval notation, we would be writing that negative infinity to positive infinity. It's defined for everything. Our second example, though, is not a polynomial. We do have a square root symbol, and remember, we cannot square root negative numbers. So our restriction is that that expression underneath the radical symbol, x minus 1, has to be greater than or equal to 0. It cannot be negative. If we add 1 to both sides, our domain is that x has to be greater than or equal to 1. And again, in that interval notation, we would state that as closed bracket from 1 to infinity. So including 1 and going everything higher. In question C, both the numerator and denominator would be considered polynomials. However, because it is a ratio, we have created a denominator and denominators cannot be 0. So our expression x minus 2 cannot be 0, which means that x cannot be 2, because a 2 in there would make that 0. To write that in interval notation, we would say we want to include everything except the 2. So we say we're going from negative infinity up to almost 2. We take a break, and then we start out just above 2 and go on to infinity. All right. We are going to look at reducing rational expressions. Our first step is to factor the numerator and denominator into prime factors. That means we factor it as far as it can go. Our second step is to simplify the expression by removing the common prime factors. If there's something that matches in the numerator or denominator, we want to get rid of that. And then the last step is to put any restrictions down on the domain from the original expression. So let's start out step one. Let's get this factored. In our numerator, we have an x squared minus 3x. We could factor an x out. We would have an x minus 3 left over. In the denominator, we have an x squared minus 9. That is a difference of squares. It factors into x plus 3 and x minus 3. So we have factored everything into its prime factors, and now we look for things that we could cancel out. Since there's a common factor of x minus 3 in both the numerator and denominator, we can reduce that out our final answer would be x divided by x plus 3. Now, step 3 says to include the restrictions on the domain from the original expression. When we look at this final answer, all right, 
it is implying that x cannot be negative 3 because negative 3 would create the, a denominator of 0. But that is considered a visible domain restriction. In other words, we can see that that's the case when we look at our answer. What we don't see is this piece right here. I guess I should point to the denominator part. But we canceled that out. It seems to disappear. However, it is a restriction from the original expression. So we are going to have to state that x cannot be a positive 3 because that restriction is not visible. It has disappeared from my final answer. All right. In Algebra 2, you typically listed both restrictions. You would have said x can't be a negative 3 and x can't be a positive 3. At this level, if it is still a visible restriction, in other words, you can still see it in your answer, you do not have to include it. We are just including the pieces that we have canceled out here. All right, the second example, we have trinomials, both for the numerator and denominator. It means we need to unfoil these. x squared, we would split into x times x. We're looking for two numbers that multiply to be negative 18 and add up to negative 3. That would be negative 6 and positive 3. In the denominator, our first term is 2x squared. There's really only way, one way to split that up. We need a 2x and an x. To get a negative 3, when I multiply, I could have a negative 3 and a 1, or a negative 1 and a positive 3. In order to get that 5, we are going to need a positive 3 here and a negative 1 here. That gets me negative 1, positive 6. That's my positive 5. Okay. So looking now at common factors that we could reduce out. I notice an x plus 3 on both of them, so I'm going to cancel that out. My answer then would be x minus 6 divided by 2x minus 1. And then my domain restriction, x cannot be this negative 3 here because negative 3 plus 3 would be 0. So we're going to restrict x not being negative 3. All right, two rational expressions are equivalent if they have the same domain and have the same value for all numbers in the domain. The reduced form of the rational expression must have the same domain as the original expression. All right, so that's what we were talking about. Uh, when we stated earlier that we have to list those domain restrictions even if it seems to have canceled out, they still need to be there um, since they were in the original expression. All right, two fractions are equal. u divided by v is equal to z divided by w if and only if their cross products match. So taking u times w, has to be the same as taking v times z. All right, so their cross products must match. A couple review things about fractions. When we are adding and subtracting fractions, we must have common denominators. So our first operation here says if we're adding two fractions, they both have a denominator of v, we can simply add the numerators. All right, we have an example on the right here. 2 thirds plus 5 thirds would be 7 thirds. If we have unlike denominators in number two here, we must get a common denominator. So we would multiply the first one by z, and we would multiply the second one by a v in order to get them to have the same denominator. We end up with uz plus vw all over vz. All right, so our example, 2 thirds plus 4 fifths. We can multiply a 5 to this one to make a 15 for a denominator and multiply this one by a 3 to make a 15 for a denominator. 5 times 2 is 10, 3, plus, 3 times 4 is 12, adding those gives us 22 fifteenths. Question 3 says if we are multiplying two fractions, we do not need a common denominator. We simply multiply straight across. So u times w over v times z. 2 thirds times 4 fifths 
would be 8 fifteenths. With division, we multiply by the reciprocal. So we take this fraction and instead of dividing, we're going to multiply by its reciprocal. So our example, 2 thirds times, divided by 4 fifths would be the same as 2 thirds times 5 fourths, which gives us 10 twelfths, and we can reduce that to 5 sixths. For subtraction in, question, in statements 1 and 2, these also apply to subtraction. We would just change our addition signs into subtraction signs. All right, a couple examples. Multiplying and dividing these rational expressions. The first thing we want to do is try to get everything to factor out. Now, if you look through these first two examples, we have a pattern here that's called a difference of cubes, and right here we have a sum of cubes. So let's take a second over on the margin here and review those factoring patterns from last year. All right, so if we have a sum of cubes, in other words, we have something like a cubed plus b cubed. We can factor that down into its root. So the first factor is simply the roots of each. Instead of a cubed, we just need an a. Instead of b cubed, we just use its root b. Then the second part is a trinomial. It's the first term squared. It's the product of the two, and it's the second term squared. All right. Now, in terms of signs, if you start with a plus, because we started with a plus, our next sign is the opposite, a negative. Our last term is always plus. For a difference of cubes, it's similar to that. Say we have a cubed minus b cubed. We can factor it down to the roots. Our first factor will have a matching sign to what we start with, so a minus sign. Our second factor is that trinomial. First term squared, the product, second term squared. If we have a negative here, we need the opposite sign there. And our last term, remember, is always positive. Anytime you square something, you'll get a positive piece. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's practice factoring this and see what we have left over. We have 2x squared plus 11x minus 21. That is a trinomial. We can factor it into 2x and x to get a 20, negative 21 and an 11 in the middle. If we put a 7 here, We'll get a 14 for outsides and a negative 3 here. 14 and negative 3 would give us our 11. The denominator, we can factor an x out of all of those. We are left with x squared plus 2x plus 4. In our second piece, that x cubed minus 8, that is that difference of cubes pattern again. We are going to have the root, so x minus, and the cube root of 8 is 2. And then we follow our pattern. We take our first term squared, opposite sign, second term times the first term, that product, so 2x, and then the second term squared, so 4. In the denominator, it's another trinomial. We are going to break up our x squared into x times x. To get negative 14 and have them add up to 5, we would need a positive 7 and a negative 2. All right, so everything has been factored. We now want to look at any common factors that we can reduce out. I see an x plus 7 that we can cancel, as long as one's on top and one's on the bottom. I see an x minus 2 that we can cancel out. And this whole trinomial, x squared plus 2x plus 4, reduces out. So the only thing we have left is the 2x minus 3 over this first x. However, we have made some domain restrictions invisible. We've canceled them out. So we have to state, in this case, x cannot be here, a negative 7. x cannot be a 2 there. 
And if you look at the trinomial that we dropped out, you might think there are some real values that would make that zero, but if you actually plug that into the quadratic formula, you get imaginary roots. So we would have nothing else to include as a domain restriction. All right, pause the video and go ahead and try to factor question B here, and then turn it back on and we will check it. Do notice that it is a division problem, which means we're going to have to multiply by the reciprocal. All right, let's check. X cubed plus one, that is a sum of cubes pattern. So we are going to have the root X plus one, the cube root of X cubed is X, the cube root of one is one. And then we have our trinomial piece, first term squared, opposite sign, the product one times X, and then the one squared. Denominator is a basic trinomial. We split up our x squared into x times x. To get a negative 2 when we multiply and have them add up to negative 1, we would need negative 2 and a positive 1. Now we're going to multiply by the reciprocal, so these two are going to flip-flop. x squared minus 4x plus 4 factors into x minus 2 times x minus 2. And the top we have x squared minus x plus 1. That does not factor. It is prime the way it is. All right, looking for common factors that we can reduce out. I see an x minus 2. I see an x plus 1. And I see a trinomial, x squared minus x plus 1, that is going to drop out. So our final answer here is just the x minus 2. However, we do have some domain restrictions that have become invisible. In our first factor, x minus 2, x could not be negative 2. Sorry, positive 2. That is a minus sign. x minus 2 would mean x cannot be a 2. x plus 1 means x cannot be negative 1. And then once again, this trinomial piece, if we plug it into the quadratic formula, would give us imaginary roots. All right, shifting from multiplying and dividing to adding and subtracting. When we are adding and subtracting, we need a common denominator. In this case, we have two totally separate expressions, 3x minus 2 and x minus 5. So the only way to get a common denominator is to include both. So we need a 3x minus 2 and we need an x minus 5. Now, to get that common denominator, our first term, x, would need to be multiplied by x minus 5. All right? We're multiplying both of these by x minus 5. Our second term already has the x minus 5. It would need to be multiplied by the 3x minus 2. All right, so for this piece in red here, we would have 3 times 3x minus 2. Then we would want to distribute. We are going to have x squared minus 5x plus 9x minus 6 all over our common denominator. We could combine some like terms. We have x squared. We can combine the negative 5x and 9x to get 4x keeping our common denominator. All right, and then I would check that numerator to see if we can factor it. However, there's no factors that multiply to be negative 6, but then also add up to a 4. So that is all we can do. We have not reduced anything out, so there are no domain restrictions that we've made invisible. For question B, notice that we already have a common denominator. So we are simply going to subtract 2x minus 1 minus the 3, all over x plus 5. Now, do be careful when it's a subtraction. If this had been several terms in there, that subtraction would have to get distributed to all the pieces inside. Since we just have a plain 3, we don't have to distribute. We have 2x minus 4 on top and x plus 5 in the denominator. We could factor a 2 out of that top. However, it does not reduce with anything in the denominator, so we would still have all of those pieces. Sorry, factoring a 2 out, this should be x minus... Let's start this over. I see a couple mistakes I made here with signs. 
All right. We have 2x plus 1. I think I had a minus 1 the first time. Minus 3. Combining like terms, we would have 2x minus 2. And then factoring a 2 out, we would have x minus 1. All right. Um, still no restrictions that can be, or no factors that can be dropped out, so we don't have to list any domain restrictions. We do have a domain restriction. x cannot be negative 5 but it is considered visible based on our answer, so we do not have to state that. All right. If the denominator of a fraction have common factors, then it is often more efficient to find the least common denominator before trying to add or subtract the fractions. We're going to look at a couple examples of that in just a second. Least common denominator is the product of all of the prime factors in the denominators where each factor is raised to the greatest power found in any one denominator for that factor. In other words, if we have a factor that has an x in its denominator, and we have another one where there's an x squared, we would need the higher powered one. We would need to have an x squared in that common denominator. All right, let's look at example five. Notice that the denominators have some things that we can factor. So let's break this down. x squared minus 2x, we could take an x out. We'd have x minus 2 left. Now as I write this, I'm going to leave some space because we're going to have to multiply in some factors to make this common. Our last term, x squared minus 4, does factor into x plus 2 and x minus 2. That's that difference of squares pattern. And so if I'm looking for my LCD, I need all the factors in my first fraction in the denominator. So I need an x and I need an x minus 2. Then I go to my second fraction. It says I need an x. Well, I've already got one, so I'm good there. Then I look at my third fraction. I need an x plus 2 and an x minus 2. I already have the x minus 2, but I would also need an x plus 2. All right, so that's what I want to turn all of the denominators into. So my first fraction is missing the x plus 2. Whatever we multiply to the denominator, we must multiply to the numerator. Our second fraction has the x, but it's missing both of those binomial pieces, x minus 2 and x plus 2. And our third fraction has the two binomials. It's simply missing the x. All right, now we have a common denominator, x times x minus 2 times x plus 2. Our numerator, if we do some distributing, we have 2x plus 4 plus, and if we FOIL out x squared, or sorry, x minus 2 times x plus 2, we get x squared minus 4, and we have a minus 3x at the end there. Now let's do some combining of like terms. We are going to have an x squared as our highest term. The 2x and the negative 3x becomes negative x. And the positive 4 and negative 4 are going to cancel each other out. All right. We can factor out an x on the top. And then notice that we do have a common factor. We have an x top and bottom, numerator, denominator. We can reduce that out. So our final answer is x minus 1 over x minus 2 times x plus 2. Now, we've made one domain restriction invisible. We took out that x. So we have to state that x cannot be 0. That would make the whole denominator 0. All right. Shifting to our last learning target of compound rational expressions. A compound fraction is a complex fraction, which means it has fractions in the numerator and or the denominator. Now there's a couple ways to simplify these. The first example here, number six, I'm going to go through this the way you probably learned in, in Algebra 2, all right, where we convert and make that whole numerator into a single fraction and we do the same thing with the denominator, and then we multiply by the reciprocal. All right, so if I were just taking the 3 minus 7 over x plus 2 and trying to get a common denominator, 
I would need to multiply the 3 by the x plus 2, top and bottom, okay? Which would give me 3x plus 6 minus 7 all over x plus 2. And if I simplify that, I have 3x minus 1 over x plus 2, okay? That's the first part. The second part of my fraction, looking at the bottom now, I have 1 minus, let me leave a little space here, 1 minus 1 over x minus 3. To get a common denominator, I would need to multiply this one. Let's try that again. This one by an x minus 3, top and bottom. All right, simplifying that piece, we are going to have x minus 3 minus 1 all over x minus 3, which gives us x minus 4 over x minus 3. All right, and then to simplify that, we are going to multiply by the reciprocal. So we are going to take 3x minus 1 over x plus 2, and instead of dividing by x minus 4 over x minus 3, we're going to multiply by x minus 3 over x minus 4. A lot of times there will be common factors that we can reduce out. In this case, we don't have any, so our answer just needs to be all of those pieces. All right, and once again, since we have no common factors that we've canceled out, we are looking at our visible domain restrictions, with one exception. We always have to have little tricks here. Because we took this fraction and flipped it over to multiply by the reciprocal to get our answer, we lost sight of the fact that x can't be negative 3, because right there it would create a 0 as a denominator. X cannot be 3. So we are going to have to state that. However, the other denominators, like this x plus 2, is still showing up, so it's still visible. All right. So how do we do this the new way? And this is the method that I want you to use. because this is the method that you will be using more in calculus. And that is to use the LCD to simplify the compound fraction. In other words, we are going to not just look at the top fraction and then the bottom fraction as separate pieces. We're going to look at all of it. So in this first example, if we look at every single denominator piece, I have an A squared, a B squared, an A, and a B. The LCD would be a squared times b squared. I would need all of those pieces to the highest power that I see. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the whole top piece by that common denominator, a squared b squared over 1. All right, we're multiplying it up on the top. And then in our denominator piece, we're going to do the same thing. So what we've really done is we've multiplied by 1. Because we're multiplying by a squared b squared, and we're dividing by a squared, b squared, right here. All right, so that's what allows us to be able to do this. And the beauty of this is it is going to get rid of a whole bunch of denominators for us. So think of distributing a squared, b squared to each of these pieces. a squared, b squared times 1 over a squared is simply b squared. And 1 over b squared times a squared, b squared, the b squareds would drop out, and we're just going to get minus a squared. So our whole top complex fraction piece has become b squared minus a squared. Doing the same thing for the denominator. This time not everything is going to go away in terms of our variables. We have an a here that will cancel with one of these a's here. We still are going to have an a and a b squared left. When I distribute to this 1 over b term, one of my b's will drop out. I still have an a squared b left. We can do some factoring. The top will factor into b minus a and 
b plus a. It's a difference of squares pattern. In the denominator, we could factor an ab out of both terms. That leaves me a b minus a left. And then I'm looking at common pieces that I can drop out. In this case, both have a b minus a term. So I'm going to have a final answer of b plus a divided by ab. Now, we do have a restriction that we've made invisible right here. If b minus a cannot be 0, since our denominator can't be 0, that means b cannot equal a. So that is my domain restriction. All right, second example. In order to figure out our LCD, we are going to need to factor this right here. All right, so we've got x cubed over x plus 1. There's nothing to factor there. In the denominator, we have x over, and looking at that trinomial, x squared plus 2x plus 1, it factors into x plus 1 times x plus 1. All right, so our LCD is going to be x plus 1 squared because this one has one of the x plus 1s, but this one has two of them. So I do need that higher power. So I am going to multiply all of this by x plus 1 squared and all of this by x plus 1 squared. And I usually put a 1 under just to help me remember that I am multiplying it to the top pieces of each of those fractions. All right, in the top part, above my black line here, one of the x plus 1s will drop out. I have 1 in the denominator and I have 2 in the numerator, so I can get rid of 1 in each. I still have the x cubed and I still have one of the x plus 1s. All right. In the second half, in the bottom complex fraction, both of the x plus 1s are going to drop out. Both of these will cancel both of those. All I have left is an x. Now, hopefully you notice that there is a common x that we can factor out of that, which would simplify this down to be x squared times x plus 1. Now, looking at our domain restrictions, what have we gotten rid of? Well, we got rid of the x right there. All right, sorry for that interruption. Mr. Janan stopped in for a second. Um, going back to our example here, we are looking for those invisible restrictions. And we have one right here. That x disappears in my final answer. So I'm going to have to state that x cannot be 0. We also cancel out these um, x plus 1 terms, so x cannot equal negative 1 as well. All right, looking at example 8. We want to simplify the expressions. This is kind of a compilation of all the topics that we've been looking at so far today. Our first one here is a complex fraction. We have fractions within fractions. Looking at all of our denominators, we have a y, an x, an x squared, and a y squared. So using that new method, we are going to multiply numerator and denominator by the LCD, which in this case would be x squared, y squared. You can put the ones under there if that helps you as you're multiplying these fractions together. All right, multiplying x over y, our first fraction, x over y times x squared, y squared. One of our y's will drop out. We would get x cubed times y. Our second fraction, the y over x, one of our x's will drop out. We'll have an x and we'll have a y cubed. For the bottom half, the x squareds drop out in our first one, we get y squared. And in our second one, the y squareds drop out and we get x squared. All right, let's look at factoring these to see if we can reduce out any common factors. The first one, I could take an x out of both and I could take a y out of both. What's left over is an x squared minus a y squared. And if I look at the denominator, y squared minus x squared, that's just the opposite. I could factor these down, but these two basically match, right? x squared minus y squared and y squared minus x squared. They're just opposites. So if I cancel them out, I have to leave a negative 1 left over to show that those are opposites. And my final answer then 
is just negative xy. Looking for domain restrictions back here. We have no denominators left in our final answer, but we had a whole bunch here. X and Y, neither one can be zero. And if we look at this denominator right here that we canceled out, X squared cannot equal Y squared, or those would cancel each other out. So if X squared cannot equal Y squared, and we square it both sides, then we're saying X cannot equal positive or negative Y or y cannot equal positive or negative x. Either one is fine. All right. Question B. We are dividing two fractions. All three or all four pieces there can be factored. All right. So 4y squared minus 9. We can factor that into 2y plus 3 and 2y minus 3, one of those difference of squares pattern. The 2y squared plus 9y minus 18, we would factor our 2y squared into 2y and y. To get an 18, we have things like 1 and 18, 2 and 9, 3 and 6. One of those numbers would have to be negative to make it a negative 18. And we're trying to get insides and outsides to add up to 9. If we have a negative 3 here, and a positive 6 here. We end up with an outside of 12y and an inside of negative 3y. That would get us the 9y we need in our middle term. Now, instead of dividing, we said we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. All right. So that y squared plus 5y minus 6 that was in the denominator is going to move up to the numerator. And we are going to factor that into y plus 6 and y minus 1. The 2y squared plus y minus 3, we're going to bring down to the denominator and factor. We'll break that 2y squared up into 2y and y. To get a negative 3, we need a 3 and 1 with one of them being negative. If we put in, let's see, a positive 3 here with a negative 1 there, we get 3y for our inside and negative 2y on the outside. That would give us the 1y. Looking for common factors that we can reduce. Let's see, I see a y minus 1, I see a 2y plus 3, I see a 2y minus 3, and I see a y plus 6. Well, every factor has dropped out, which means my final answer is 1. However, I do have a whole bunch of domain restrictions. Let's go in pieces here. For this one, y could not be 3 halves. If you take 2y minus 3, and set it equal to 0. We'd add the 3, divide out the 2, and that would create a 0. So we're going to say that y cannot be 3 halves. Our second factor here, the y plus 6. y cannot be negative 6, or that would become a 0. On this one, we have a 2y plus 3. So y cannot be negative 3 halves. And on this one, y minus 1. So y cannot be a positive 1. All right, now, remember that this was a denominator. We've moved it up to the numerator when we flipped it, but any restrictions from here or here would also have to be listed. But since those same factors showed up later in other places in the denominators, we already have those restrictions listed in our answer. All right, our last two questions. Question C, we are adding two fractions, but they do not have a common denominator. So we have to create that. So the first thing I'm going to do, I need to multiply this first fraction by x minus 3, top and bottom, second fraction by x plus 5. That will create matching denominators then I can keep that denominator and I can distribute on the top x minus 3 plus 2x plus 10 and then I can simplify that numerator I have 3x plus 7 over x plus 5 times x minus 3. None of the factors are common so we do not have any uh, factors that cancel out or any domain restrictions that become invisible. 
All right, the last question, D. Just a simple fraction they're asking us to simplify even further. We can factor both the numerator and denominator. The numerator, x squared breaks into x times x. We need two numbers that multiply to be negative 20 and add up to negative 1. So negative 5, positive 4. Denominator, our 2x squared will factor into 2x and x. To get a negative 4 here, we could have 4 and 1 with one of them negative, or 2 and 2 with one of them negative. We're looking to get a 7. If we put a 4 here, we get an 8 with a negative 1 here. That would give us our 7 that we are looking for in the middle. All right, then we look for common factors that we can cancel out. In this case, the x plus 4s. Final answer is x minus 5 over 2x minus 1. And since we canceled out that x plus 4, we have to state that there is a restriction that x cannot be negative 4. All right, your assignment. As I said, we're going to spend a little over a day on this, but we'll have you go ahead and get started today. Um, page 794 in the back of your book, 1 through 7 odd, 9 through 24, multiples of 3, so 9, 12, 15, etc. 27 to 31 odd, 33 to 60 multiples of 3, 61, 63, 66, 69, 71, and 73.